good morning uh, i extend a very warm welcome to each one of you especially my mentor professor anil mitra uh, who taught me law and uh, many years ago i went to aligarh university from allahabad just to study history uh, from professor irfan habib so i have a genuine interest in history but uh, over last 25 years or so i completely lost touch uh, with history but uh, when professor stephen met me in delhi we thought we need to revive this uh, tradition of uh, legal history uh, both me and professor mitra are members of bar council and it is strange that uh, when i went to law school legal and constitutional history was a mandatory subject but it is no more a mandatory course and in uh, some law schools we teach history but we don't teach really uh, legal and constitutional history so those were the days when uh, we had a three year program after graduation so now we have integrated social sciences uh, with law but uh, legal history as a subject uh, uh, somewhere you know uh, has lost the importance which it used to have uh, lately uh, we have found that uh, we need to revisit history Uh, say for uh, at the moment the country is uh, debating the whole question of uh, reforms in uh, personal laws and part of the problem of rigidity uh, in personal laws uh, is contribution of british judges as all of you know that initially they used to take help of uh, experts in hindu law and muslim law when uh, matters relating to muslim law and hindu law used to come before the british judges and then they undertook the translation of the religious text uh, which were not correctly translated and then relied on those translations as if they were the statute enacted by uh, some legislature and uh, both in hindu law and muslim law uh, they brought in notions of uh, british common law to begin with uh, uh, equity justice and good conscience and then almost the entire uh, common law was uh, uh you know imported to india uh, for instance the british judges were uh, not able to understand that uh, uh, women can be an absolute owner of uh, property because under their law uh, she was having only limited estate and uh, they even in manu smriti you can find at least half a dozen situations where she can be an absolute owner or in muslim law they applied the doctrine of precedent which is unknown to muslim law each case is different and may have a different uh, decision uh, this morning you know we had a group uh, people who had studied in aligarh and were all my seniors and uh, we used to look at them with a uh, lot of uh, respect and admiration so the group was teaching in particular najaf bhai he was telling me number of things so for instance about the capital punishment i was asking him that uh, one the number of uh, offenses for which uh, you can have death penalty uh, if you go by the british law uh, even till late 19th century as many as 204 offenses were punishable with death including pickpocket and uh, the story goes like this that there was a public hanging to have a deterrence and when one pick pocket was being hanged uh, at russell square and number of spectators were there 21 pick pockets were committed then and there so that was this much about deterrence but uh, during mughals i was uh, discussing with him that uh, in one go death penalty would not be given it is to be mentioned to the emperor and mentioned on three different occasions so only when three times uh, Uh, the emperor has said that the person is to be executed then only he will be executed but what uh, najaf bhai was telling me this morning that it was not about uh, such serious matters as death penalty but uh, even in ordinary decision making uh, this was the mughal practice that uh, when a matter is referred to the emperor uh, he will make some decision and then after some time generally after a month or so and it will be recorded in some court diary called yaddasht or what and it will be mentioned again to him after uh, proper uh, study or implications of this think of current demonetization 
if on 8th of <laughs> December the same matter is referred back to Modi ji, he may like to you know review it, but uh, we do not have that kind of system. So, he was telling me that uh, the Christian missionaries approached uh, Emperor uh, Akbar and said that since uh, uh, Islam says that there is no compulsion in religion, therefore we should be allowed to convert people and there has to be a decree of the emperor permitting us to convert people. You know in India in as many as half a dozen states, uh, we have anti-conversion laws and I have been writing against them that uh, these conversion laws do impinge on freedom of religion and uh, the Supreme Court decision uh, on this subject is absolutely wrong and needs uh, a review. Even Sirvai has said that this decision is uh, productive of great public mischief and must be overruled. So, these people approached uh, King uh, Akbar and he said, yes, uh, you must have a decree. And then uh, after when number of days passed and uh, no decree was issued, so they approached the concerned officials and then the official said that this uh, involves public uh, law and order issues and whatever king says, you know, this does not immediately become a law, we have to mention it back to him. And then again they lobbied and of course at the end of the day, the decree permitting conversion uh, was issued. But the point I am trying to draw home is that there is so much to learn and so much to study about how the entire legal system evolved and uh, how even sentencing as a discipline uh, was well developed. Uh, we have not paid enough attention to legal history. Uh, uh, yesterday night we were discussing about uh, 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 the Sadar Diwani Adalats and how do we study about the judgments given by them, uh, but uh, somewhat how we lost the record. I understand that a pure historian may not be interested uh, in legal institutions or legal history, but since in India now we have as many as 18 uh, full-fledged law universities and for my international delegates benefit I can say that we are the only country in the world where this concept of having a full-fledged law university in its own right, you know, uh, has been experimented and has been a huge success. Now we attract best of the students to these schools when former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh has said that in a sea of mediocrity we have few islands of excellence called national law universities. So I think it is a job of national law universities where like IITs, humanities are not given uh, the importance which they deserve, but at Nalsar we are trying to attach lot of importance to humanities and I am grateful that the Max Planck Institute and Nalsar have come together uh, to initiate uh, this dialogue and take it forward. And there cannot be a better person than Professor N. L. Mitra to inaugurate this important workshop. You know, for the last 25 years or so, I went to NLS uh, for the first time in 1991. And since then, uh, Professor Mitra in uh, various capacities has been guiding me. And whatever uh, little I am today, uh, it is only because of uh, Professor N. L. Mitra. So, sir, uh, I know you, that you are not in the best of the health and uh, you agreed to come over. Uh, I am also grateful to Professor Stephen, uh, Max Planck Institute and all my seniors and other delegates uh, who have found time to come to the um, Nalsar um, during the week. Uh, and uh, I am sure we are going to have uh, uh, really a, a good uh, um, uh, deliberations. It's a, a small group, and it has been made purposely that we should not be, you know, uh, playing to the galleries and have people who are not genuinely interested in the deliberations which are taking place. So I am sure that we will have very rich deliberations. Uh, once again, I am uh, grateful to Professor Mitra, uh, Professor Stephen, and all others. Thank you very much.
I'm Elizabeth. I teach history and women and law related courses at the National Law School, Bangalore. Uh, I'm Austin Bhatt. I'm finishing my PhD in law uh, from Yale uh, Law School. So I'm not a legal historian and in a South Asian legal workshop, so I'm adequately intimidated. Really happy to be here. Um, my name is Razak Khan. I'm a research fellow at uh, Center for Modern Indian Study, Göttingen University. Uh, and I'm also not a legal historian, but I'm interested in the idea of thinking of ways of uh, beyond boundaries. So my work is concerned with thinking about India and Germany in comparative perspective. And I'm looking forward to learn from the workshop. Thank you. I'm Bharat Hassan. I teach history at Delhi University. Hello, I'm Jean-Philippe Dequin. I'm a researcher at uh, Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt. And uh, I do do legal history, but I'm uh, <laughs> very happy to get all the feedback from all the other historians present. Um, my name is Aparna Balachandran. I teach history at Delhi University. And uh, my work is on early colonial law in South India. Uh, my name is Rohit Dehi. I teach history at Yale University. Uh, I'm also an Indian lawyer. Uh, Hi, my name is uh, Donald Kafi. I'm a researcher at the Max Planck Institute. I'm Rajat Dutta. I teach uh, history at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. I'm interested in um, largely early modern economy, uh, particularly the economy of transition from the late medieval to an early, early colonial um, formation. Navid Masood, a former civil servant and possibly the least educated uh, in this gathering, but uh, of late, I mean, or rather in the last couple of decades, to try to, I mean, you know, uh, inculcate a degree of interest and particularly in archival matters. So that possibly will be an apology for my presence here. Besides that, the civil servant in India who created this. Or thoughts. Uh, hello, I am Najaf Hadil. I teach history at the Jawaharlal Nehru University and my area of interest is uh, Mughal history. Thank you. Hello, I am Ishan Kalam. I teach, uh, teach at Delhi Muslim University in the Department of History. And uh, my area of interest is largely, you know, Indo-Dutch trade based on Dutch East India Company records. Then it touches upon legal aspects also. My name is Srimar Rajahadari. I teach history at Shivnagar University. And I have been doing medical history, but this is a scope for making a transition to legal history. And I look forward to your feedbacks. Uh, I'm Sanghar Chauhan. I'm a lecturer here. I'm your host for the next two days. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mayur. Um, I am a lawyer and I, I teach at um, SOAS in London. I've recently embraced the term uh, legal anthropologist, so that's, that's what I am. Um, it's mostly looking at anti-terror laws and um, again, not legal history, but looking forward to seeing what I can learn from it. Thanks. I'm Rajushri Ghosh. I'm an assistant professor of history at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. I'm interested in Islamic legal history during the colonial period. I'm Sri Rahul and I teach uh, Constitutional Law and Administrative Law at Symbiosis Law School, Hyderabad. I am Ashwini Kumar. I teach uh, jurisprudence in Nalsa University of Law. Thank you. I'm Dr. Shafi, faculty in Nalsa University of Law. I'm Dr. Shankar Rao. I started my career as a teacher right from uh, teaching history, particularly legal and constitutional history. The judicial system, particularly Sadar Nizamat Adalat, Sadar Dhanani Adalat, all those things I enjoyed. I love history. Thank you. I am Anuradha Prasad. I teach criminal law at Nalsar University and I am also pursuing my PhD under Professor Faisal Mustafa on criminal law. Thank you.
Faizan Mustafa, I am a student of law, gone to number of universities, yet my education is not complete. Education doesn't get complete any time. I am going to be a part of history very soon. I'm Stefan Vogenauer and I'm a director of the Max Planck Institute for European and Comparative Law and I'm very grateful that uh, NALSA has invited us to share this event with you. you can. Shall I, yeah. shall I go? Okay. Good. Well, um, I've, been, I've been asked to, to give an, an overview of, of the workshop. Professor Vivekanand is our senior professor. Uh, he holds MHRD's uh, chair on IPR. Well, and, and perhaps, uh, first of all, thanks again for the very kind invitation uh, when uh, Professor Faisal Mustafa uh, told me that um, they had a beautiful campus. I didn't know how beautiful it is, and when he said this would be a very good time of the year to visit, I didn't know how nice it would be. So um, we're very pleased to be here. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful also for all the, uh, the preparations also um, to Siddharth. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, perhaps I should say a little bit about the, the, the background of the legal history research um, that we're doing in Frankfurt, because that will perhaps also explain a little bit the background um, to this workshop. So um, maybe a little bit about the institutional setup of uh, the research field that we're currently building up. Um, and, and then, um, obviously, I'm going to say a few words on, on this particular workshop. Um, the, the Max Planck Institute for European Legal History is, uh, as, as you will gather, uh, uh, one of the institutes of the Max Planck Society, uh, which is an, an independent research um, organization that is separate from the university structure, perhaps a little bit like the national law universities are separate from everyone else. Um, its uh, its uh, mission, so to speak, in the higher education system is to do research only. We don't teach undergraduates. So, uh, and even within the field of research, we're meant to do fundamental research or basic research not applied research. So um, the motto um, that the Max Planck Society has, uh, which goes back to Max Planck, the physicist himself, is that uh, we have to gather insight first and only then we can <coughs> apply it. So insight precedes application. Um, there are 83 Max Planck Institutes across Germany and they're mostly in the hard sciences, and this is really what the Max Planck Society is known for. Um, they're very much top um, in their respective fields. Um, I always say that I'm very grateful that I'm not at a science Max Planck Institute, because there the pressure is pretty high. Um, you're expected to win the Nobel Prize at some stage in your career. I can gladly say in law, um, this will not be expected of you, thank God. Um, but but uh, um, the Max Planck Society prides itself that really all the uh, post-war Nobel Prizes that went to Germany went to directors of the Max Planck Institute and that all the major scientific breakthroughs um, in German science are in a way originating from Max Planck. I mean, just recently the, um, the discovery of the gravitational waves, uh, that was a collaboration between the MIT and a Max Planck Institute. So we, we think of ourselves as a kind of decentralized research university uh, where we cover quite a few disciplines but in 83 different locations scattered all over Germany. Now 11 of these institutes um, are having a focus in law or in law related matters. So in, in the broadest sense there's even an institute on legal anthropology uh, in Halle, um, but we also do um, issue fields like tax law, comparative constitutional law, uh, public international law, um, European law, private international law. And, and all of these 11 institutes have um, a specific 
international or comparative focus. So even the tax lawyers, where you think they're normally very much focused on their own legal system, um, uh, they, they have a very broad and international and comparative outlook. There's also an institute on intellectual property matters, on competition law, um, you name it. Um, as I said, we don't teach undergraduates, but uh, the idea is very much to teach or educate, as they're called, junior researchers or junior scientists. So there is a massive PhD program and um, also postdoctoral training is, is part of the mission of the Max Planck Institutes. So the idea is to get the brightest uh, graduates from the universities, then put them through rigorous doctoral and postdoctoral training uh, so that at the end of their postdoctoral career, uh, they're in a position to take up a chair uh, in a university. Now, the uh, Max Planck Institute uh, for European Legal History um, that um, JP and Donald and I uh, are representing here is uh, one of the post-war institutes. It was established in 1964, and uh, it has the mission to research European legal history. Uh, so you will obviously ask, what are we doing in India? But I'm going to come to that in a minute. In the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, European legal history was really understood to be uh, the conventional history of the Jus Commune, the medieval and early modern uh, and even modern um, amalgam of Roman law and customary law and the law of the Catholic Church that was prevailing in continental Europe and with a strong focus on private law. Mm, but whenever a director at Max Planck retires, the idea is that uh, an entirely new research field will be built up. So uh, from then on, the institute moved on um, to do very different things. For example, uh, the history of Byzantine law or 19th century German law. And my immediate predecessor, for example, um, researched the history of German public law, which had been totally under-researched before. At present, there are two departments at the institute uh, with different research fields. My colleague Thomas Duve, um, who started there some five years ago, uh, started his life also as a canon lawyer, an expert in the history of the Roman Catholic Church and its law. But he also has a very strong interest in the history of South America. And this is really the first time the Institute moved beyond European borders. And of course, the South American um, legal systems are all very much bearing the imprint of Spanish legal history and Portuguese legal history. But Thomas Duva also uh, took another step, and he said we should perhaps see that European legal history is just a regional legal history within the framework of a much broader global legal history. And this is really the, the step that we're currently going as an institute, that we are um, trying to localize European legal history and see it very much as a part of a much broader um, global movement and a global legal history. Now, I started at the Max Planck Institute a year ago, and I'm currently establishing two research fields. Um, one is more European in focus. Um, it's about the history of the law of the European Union. Now, the European Union, as you know, is also 60 years old by now. So it's very much a part of contemporary history. And there are many legal issues surrounding the European Union. There's a massive body of European Union law that permeates the legal systems of the member states. And um, the idea is to turn this into a new subdiscipline of legal history. Um, so far, we've often studied the uh, legal histories of nation states or of certain regions, but this is the legal history of a, well, uh, a unique phenomenon that's, that calls itself a sui generis um, legal system. 
um, but it's very much contemporary legal history. The second research field, and this is where we're getting to this meeting, is um, what I call legal transfer in the common law world. Um, and I'm going to say a few more words on this in a minute. But you can see the overlap of these various activities that we pursue at the moment, um, the legal history of South America, um, the legal history of the European Union, and the legal history of the Commonwealth, um, it's really devo developing a new notion of global legal history or transnational legal history. Um, and within that very broad framework, we try not to limit ourselves to any given period or any particular area of law, because you will all know this as soon as you enter uh, a subject area or you approach a subject area, the categories don't really work very well. So what may be criminal law in one legal system may be constitutional law in another system. So um, we're deliberately not limiting ourselves to, say, um, administrative law. Mm. We also have, just as a point of information, because this may come up once or twice uh, during these two days, um, apart from these research fields, and there are other research fields that we pursue at the institute for which we have experts, I'm just picking out these, these few, we have a number of so-called research focus areas where we look at um, our various research projects through the prism of an overarching topic. Um, one of these uh, focus areas is perhaps particularly um, pertinent to the Indian context. It's multi-normativity. So the idea uh, that what we tend to call a legal system often has a variety of subsystems that somehow interact um, um, and, and have to be coordinated and navigated and sometimes can't be coordinated because they're so complex. Um, we also have a research focus area where we look at legal spaces. Again, um, we're very accustomed to look at legal systems through the prism of the nation state, but very often, of course, laws or customs um, don't stop at the border of a nation state. Um, sometimes within a nation state, we have different laws in force. Um, we also have a focus area that we call conflict regulation, and I'm particularly delighted that we even have a panel here that will look at conflict regulation. And our fourth and final uh, focus area is on cultural translation of the law, where we look particularly at the language of the law and how this travels uh, in different contexts. Um, we all know that we cannot simply translate legal concepts um, because legal concepts develop a particular meaning in uh, a legal uh, context or against a legal background. So these focus areas um, uh, give us a bit of a theoretical framework within which we pursue our various research projects. Uh, at this institute, at present, if we include the doctoral students, there are about 60 researchers um, who work on different areas uh, or topics in legal history and uh, an overall staff of a uh, hundred plus including librarians uh, and other support staff. Um, we do have an extensive visitors program so if anyone is interested to visit the Center of Legal History in Europe um, you're very welcome uh, to, to go to our web page and, and have a look at this. Uh, every summer we operate a summer school for doctoral and postdoctoral students, so there's a lot going on. Uh, for the particular research field, legal transfer in the common law world, um, this is obviously why we're interested in India. Um, the phenomenon of legal transfer is very well known. Uh, people often speak of legal transplants or legal receptions or the borrowing of laws. Um, it's a recurring theme in legal history and in comparative law. Uh, for European lawyers, the great reception was the reception of Roman law in the Middle Ages, um, but we also uh, have 
done research in the past few decades uh, very much on the reception of continental legal ideas in England because uh, for a long time English legal historians have told us that English law flourished in noble isolation from the continent but if you look a bit closer uh, that was certainly not the case. And then of course um, there's been a lot of reception of European laws in Europe and overseas. Um, the French Code Civil um, uh, was adopted in many European countries. The Swiss Civil Code or massive parts of it were adopted in Turkey. Um, Roman Dutch law uh, and German constitutional law were adopted in South Africa. So in a way this is not an isolated phenomenon. Um, lawyers are perhaps not particularly original thinkers, so rather than inventing something new, they, they borrow it from somewhere else. Now, um, in, within that context, there are many questions which you can always ask again. Um, I mean, is it actually feasible to have legal transference or don't they change their nature so much in their new context that um, the end product, product is very different from the original rule or principle. Mm. Also, uh, a general question is, are legal transfers uh, a one-way street? I mean, if we're talking about India, we do, of course, think of the legal transfer of the common law and um, how, how that came to India. But um, is there perhaps also something that went back to uh, the metropolis, perhaps via the Privy Council? Is there, um, uh, is, is, is this a one-way street or is it rather a kind of circulation um, of ideas? Um, obviously, again, talking about the Indian context, um, the notion of reception invokes the idea uh, that this is a voluntary process. But in the context of colonialism, of course, it is not a voluntary process. It's something that is imposed. Um, and um, in a way, as the receiving country or the borrowing country, then um, you're stuck with the legal transfer that you have received. But then again, at least after independence, the question is, how do you then develop uh, that law that you have inherited, perhaps even against your will? And if you develop it further, which parts of the law do you develop further? How do you deviate um, Indian law? I think would be particularly interesting in the context of constitutional law, where there's a, a flourishing doctrine that has even become, again, a model for other parts of the world, which, of course, has nothing to do with the constitutional law in the UK, particularly in the human rights context. So so the, the, the phenomenon of of legal transfer or legal transplant um, raises a number of general overarching questions that ultimately tell us a lot about the development of law. Um, but uh, at least I personally am very skeptical that there are uh, the sil silver bullet answers to these questions uh, that, we can much, that we can learn much more by looking at different contexts very closely studying individual instances and what we will probably find is that this process of borrowing um, happens in very different ways in different parts of the world. Now the common law is a good starting point because at least in theory it is the same law that was then transplanted to um, India and Jamaica and Ghana and uh, the interesting thing is now what happens in these different contexts. And this is, in a way, uh, the general idea that we're pursuing in um, this research field. Arguably, relatively little research has been done in this context, certainly not by legal historians. Um, and people have often asked me, why are you doing this in Frankfurt? This should be done by someone in London or someone else in the Commonwealth. And I always say, well, perhaps my colleagues in London just don't see the question as much because they still, maybe they don't believe in it, but perhaps they've never questioned the quasi-mythological unity of the common law. That's very much the starting point. Um, 
and you can even see that today the Privy Council and the UK Supreme Court will often talk about the unity of the common law and that it is a value as such to preserve it. Um, so uh, there are of course examples where you can see that the common law was adopted and maintained very much uh, like in England. So if you go to Singapore, uh, they really make a virtue of it that they are, as they say themselves, a carbon copy of English law. Or just in an area of the law that I worked in recently, um, the common law has traditionally got in, in contract law this very strong doctrine of privity so that you cannot have a contract uh, that is enforceable for the benefit of a third party. But then in 1999, uh, England introduced legislation to permit this. And then just a few years later, Hong Kong rushed uh, to legislate exactly in the same manner um, and, and in a way uh, uh, introduced more or, oops, more or less uh, uh, identical legislation. So, so the question is, of course, is it possible to think of the common law as a monolithic block. Um, if it was rolled out in societies and cultures that are as diverse as India, Australia, um, the Caribbean, um, Nigeria, then all of them somehow received English law, but certainly to different degrees at different moments in time um, and in very different environments uh, physically and culturally. So what we try to find out in this research field is whether there are any general traits, whether there are significant divergences, significant commonalities, and what are the factors responsible for these similarities or divergences. And at this stage, we're just starting out with a number of case studies and individual research projects uh, mostly focusing on South Asia uh, and the Caribbean. Um, sorry, Donal. Um, but that's, that's how, how we ended up in the first recruitment round. And, and, and this workshop is really uh, meant to um, enable us to get to know colleagues from India who might share our interests. Um, many of you have said um, you're not legal historians in the narrow sense, but uh, legal history is obviously very much a borderline discipline uh, that is done both by historians and lawyers. And um, at, the, at the Max Planck, uh, we don't only employ uh, lawyers or, or, or researchers with a law degree. Um, in, in my team, there is, for example, uh, uh, a lady who's um, very strongly interested in anthropology. Uh, there's another lady who has got a master's in Chinese studies because she works on uh, the interface of the common law and Chinese law in the late 19th century. So in a way, um, we are generally and genuinely interested in uh, what other disciplines can contribute. And I'm actually um, extremely glad that uh, uh, so many of you would not define yourselves as uh, legal historians in the narrow sense. So, so this is really um, an attempt to get a conversation going that may go on in the future, um, bringing together some of our researchers and, and uh, uh, colleagues from India. Um, we will, you will have seen that the program has got uh, five panels stretching over this afternoon and tomorrow full day. Mm. Jean-Philippe and Sidat have tried as much as possible to um, find panels that enable people who at least broadly have similar interests um, uh, to speak one after the other. The, um, uh, the diversity or the heterogeneity of, of this group obviously means uh, that some of the panels are also somewhat heterogeneous. Um, but you can see just from the um, uh, panel titles, uh, the connection also to the research field that we're currently building up, well, history of legal transfers to and from India. Yeah? So is this already legal globalization or just a prelude to it? 
Um, then uh, this after, later this afternoon, um, conflict regulation uh, in the colonial context, obviously also in the local context. Um, and then uh, tomorrow, uh, the and again, obviously India is a particularly rich uh, field for this question of minorities and how does the law address um, problems uh, that will arise if you have a strong majority and um, uh, a multitude, really, of minorities. Um, then the Mughal period obviously um, has to has to feature uh, if we talk about legal history and then uh, moving to the colonial area and colonial governance tomorrow afternoon. Uh, that's just a very rough overview, but my introductory remarks were mostly um, uh, trying to set out a wider research context uh, in which this um, idea arose. And, um, I, I can say that when we started looking around um, for someone in India who would be prepared to host uh, such an event, we were very quickly um, directed to Nalsa, and, and we were told, well, um, there's, a, uh, there's a vice chancellor who's actually a historian, uh, although he does many other things. <laughs> and and, um, and it's uh, obviously one of the top law schools anyway, so, so they would be a great partner. And I have to say it's been um, an enormous pleasure preparing this event with Faisal and Mustafa. Um, uh, it's uh, not easy to do this uh, between continents, but um, I think it's worked out very well. And I'm very grateful to all of you uh, for attending this workshop. Some of you have traveled quite far. Um, and I very much look forward to the coming one and a half days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for your appetizer. Um, I already told you that perhaps I am a wrong person in a wrong seat. I am neither historian, far away from legal history and illegal history. Interaction of history is very close to our heart, each one of us our heart, but Indians never were good historians. That struck me quite early. In national school, I think um, pre-Elizabeth period, not uh, Elizabeth of Queen Elizabeth, our Elizabeth. We had a one round deliberation, importance of history in the legal study. And at that, in that uh, conglomeration, we understood that history is important in every field because history perhaps repeats itself. In every field, history has to be excavated. So, but then our primary object was what? So, our the founder director, his primary object was legal education in the undergraduate level. Though it is called National Law School of India University, but in fact, we did not start as a university, we started just as a law school. And our focus was only teaching and learning for the profession, writ large. And I understand when I wanted to start NLM course with specialization, there was a rebuff. And it was never ever during up to that uh, Professor Madden's time was an important feature of National Law School at all. I understand, if you ask me, I understand the difference between university and a college like this. College is for students. Developed colleges for students, if you take the history of colleges, important colleges, you will find that college is for students. If students are not there, college is also not there. As a matter of fact, in India, 
for four or five months colleges remain closed because students are not there. In summer vacation, winter vacation, rainy vacation, puja vacation, this vacation, that vacation. But the university is teacher focus. The university is teacher focus. Even if students are in holiday, research has to continue. So, university, to my understanding, when, when I became the vice chancellor, I had to put my shoe in this vice chancellor shoe, take that shoe. I thought there must be two disciplines. One university, in one university, one is a teaching postgraduates and undergraduates, just like a college, and the other are centers. So, I started creating center, center for intellectual property, center for environmental studies, center for child and the law, center for women and the law, like that. So, center started and center started researching. I believe now there are good numbers of researches, research centers going on. So, it is almost like, like your history of 60 years history of mass law or your institutions. Uh, India is national law school is also perhaps looking like that, but I am very happy that one of the very um, interesting thing that I wanted at one point of time that national law school must have a place of studying history, history of legal institutions. How come we could not find a linkage between one era, Mughal era, pre-Mughal era, Maurya period, Gupta period? We do not have a linkage of history and Britishers, though they transplanted, they say they have transplanted common law, but in fact when I read more of British law, it was not, it is not common law, it is a statutory law, it is almost codified, completely codified. And then there is a philosophical uh, contradiction, you say common law. But you make a statute and say India has to follow this. Now, in the common law, generally background is the people. Common law comes from the people. Common law comes from the grassroots and it goes up and up to write a history. Indians have never written history. It is for the first time Mughals, in pre Mughal, history is you will take from whom? Yuen um, uh, People like that. Some Greek historians have written some history. And Mughal period, you say Akbar Nama, Babar Nama, Akbar Nama, Aurangzeb's diary. Now, you have a kind of, kind of statutory, uh, I mean, kind of legal institutional processes coming up. So, the link is actually has to be established. This link has to be established. So, we thought that uh, there must be a good center for history, but think is that in national law school to have a center you require at least at least six, seven researchers coming up. That type of um, uh, that type of economic uh, power was not with national law schools. Therefore, this center uh, I believe uh, there is now a center for subaltern studies, isn't it, Elizabeth? There is a center for subaltern studies in national law school, perhaps. Indigenous peoples. No. Oh. no center of history yet, because you have to have a center of history. Then you require five, six, seven people to research on that, and uh, it is difficult even now also in national law school to have a kind of a center like that in uh, areas like legal research. And to me, when we debated in bar council, I always take a position that if I teach criminal law, I have to first teach a history of criminal law, how criminal law came into existence. So, where, where is this criminal law coming from? So, if I do anything, I try to trace the history. I teach a course now on uh, regulatory system, economic regulatory uh, um, processes. And in that economic regulatory processes that India started and India copied from various sources including your country, right. Now, India has to 
it goes on subtly facing a problem, subtly you have a cut paste attitude. You do not look at your background, rich background because you do not have a research. Now, some good research centers are there in India. Law schools have to develop very quickly some research center and if, uh, in the process of history perhaps uh, in the uh, department of history or in the center of history, uh, we should develop a good strong research center. And Mustafa being here, I foresee that he will have a kind of something like this. But fun perhaps is a constraint. <coughs> fun perhaps is a constraint. Now, having said that, what is the he raised that since I am on, also in the BCI, uh, our uh, Bar Council of India called BCI, who is looking after the professional studies, what is their attitude about legal history? That legal history is not now, legal and constitutional history is not now a part of a compulsory paper. Now, we thought compulsory paper killed the energy of everybody. So, can you reduce compulsory papers? Still, we could not reduce uh, substantial. We have reduced from 32 to 24, but still we could not reduce. It has to be further reduced. It has to be taken from the point of view of your intention, our students intention to learn something, we have to open that both in education as well as in research, we must open the opportunities and they have to choose. Okay? And uh, I am sure given the opportunity, uh, history has to, uh, has to bounce back as a focal of, focus of study in the national law schools everywhere, because on that only we can create a tradition. We cannot create anything without understanding where history lies. Now, this is one part. The other part is that today, if you look at any law, you want to see what the other countries are for. Okay? Now, globalization is what? Globalization is the globalization of instruments of administration and globalization of legal processes, globalization of legal, economic and legal processes. Now, if you have to go for legal processes, anything that we today research, I learned it when I was the chairman of financial fraud committee, a committee to overview the financial frauds. Now, financial fraud, fraud in India, even today is not an offense, even today it is not an offense, fraud in India even today is not an offense. Serious fraud in England is an offense. In India, fraud is not offense. Fraud is an offense in England. Why? Because they had a fraud act. We do not have a fraud act. Uh, in, in India, if there has to be a kind of an offense. Offense has to be either uh, falsification of accounts, embezzlement of cash, or it may be a cheating, forgery. In every case, you require intention first to commit the offense. Financial fraud is not like that. It does not, it may not have initial um, intention at all. Now, Vijay Malia might not have initial intention of going back to England, not paying, might not have that intention. So, in order to prove the intention, I have to have the whole lot of arguments and that will take years and years and years. Vijay Malia being here also, we could not have realized the money for, because we do not know that it requires hard tackling of financial fraud. It is a regulatory process and regulator has to deal with it very seriously and financial fraud was not an offense. Insider trading in India was not an offense. It became, it became an offense only under 2013 Act. See that, but all these countries that we, have, uh, we are taking, we are learning from, they have, they have learned that this has to be dealt with separately because from their history it is repeated. So, whenever we are faced with certain provisions and we say we have to make a law, we have this problem because we do not have any, uh, con we have strong on contemporary law, contemporary history also perhaps, but we are very poor on comparative analysis. We require comparative study more on constitutional law, more on criminal law. We have to see comparative studies only if we have a good understanding of the history of the institutions. 
if we have a more about history of the institutions, we will not be able to, uh, we will not be able to uh, deal with any problem very seriously. Uh, take the problem seriously of the market economy, you have to look at in every piece of legislation a complete process of history. If we do not do that, we are poorer. We became poorer because we do not know the history. Now, having said that, where do we start? Now, Mustafa's heart lies on two issues I know. One is that he is very interested to understand comparative constitutional process. Right, Mustafa? And the second his heart lies in comparative Hindu law, Muslim law and other religious laws, personal law we call it. He wants to know the history more about that and try to understand how history has changed from period to period and history becomes still relevant while you interpret because our, um, if you say Indian, India, Indian legal system, you say it is a common law legal system, it is absolutely a wrong word because we are statutory system, we are not common law system. Second, India still religious system prevails, ecclesiastical system. India has ecclesiastical system in all our personal law, ecclesiastical process still going on. India has constitutional process and therefore, criminal law and constitutional law, there is a conflict always and Supreme Court being creative has given many new areas of ideas. Now, if we think that we have to perhaps become closer to the civil law structure. I always think that civil law, common law, this from the ideation point of view, philosophical point of view was different, but the actuation point of view perhaps it was not that different. Am I right? Am I wrong? Now, history is not opinion perhaps. Our problem, India's problem is this, that history we take it as a kind of a process of opinion. Really. History is fact yesterday and fact is that there is inequation. The society goes through inequation processes. Game rules are different. Okay? Inequation processes, completely uneven uh, structure. So, if it is administration, you see uneven, you tell me the, uh, uh, tell me the lawyer, I will give you the judge, uneven distribution, because you have to know the face and then read the uh, history, it is the, the other way around. But in every case we are having this type of problems. Now this problem is because we have not seen our faces through the mirror of history. Now India requests, particularly law schools request to build up the history department uh, in a new fashion, in a new process. And uh, uh, I am worried, how do you build up that? Okay. Now, I will also try to think how can you build up a center in Hyderabad. Okay. Can you build up a center for Hyderabad? And if I, if I have some resource accumulations anywhere, I will try to also help you. Thank you very much. is in leg. So, if he stands up there, he may take an hour. He will definitely take an hour. But there also, standing there also, I could not help, I could not help my breath repeated, right? Because dehydration is uh, really… Did you should have requested you to address it in down. No, I no, asked him. Do you prefer? No, then maybe… He knows, my switch is on leg. <laughs> 
Ah, perhaps I, I should have uh, sat down here. That's right. Fine, there is some time for you to reflect. Can, can, can I perhaps just make a comment on, on the... Uh, a, a short comment on the position of legal history, because you, you raised it that many law schools um, or the law schools don't should, uh, don't have it in their curriculum anymore um, and um, yes yeah yes so and also that there's a relatively little institutional structure like centers um, uh, in this regard and this is this to me when when we we started also looking for partners here in India this to me came as a big surprise because you would think um, that India in particular uh, with its very rich tradition um, and and also its its very rich history not only in legal matters of course uh, would would be a, a a country where legal history should be flourishing um, and and I find this this very difficult to explain um, is it is it perhaps that um, with independence there was a very strong feeling that one would only be forward-looking from now on? Um, perhaps you have an idea why why this is so, because I, I can't see why there should be less interest in legal history in India than in other countries. I ask myself repeatedly this question. I myself, I ask myself. Um, I see Indians, India is very rich in creative literature and mythology. We're very rich in mythology. But the problem with mythology is that how much is the history and how much is not, you cannot distinguish. Right? So if I accept mythology as a history, that, that's now the present, present trend. One of the present trend is you use mythology as the history. If this is the trend, then perhaps history will be really, really become poor. Mythology is not the history. So there, in mythology, the quantum of history may be there. Some quantum of history may be there. So that's the main thing. Now, as, as such, we do not find good institutional history in, in pre-Mughal period. But at most, say, 1500 years, we have legal literature, we have mythology, good mythology, good legal literature, but we do not have history of the institutions. How this has happened? Now, if you read Manusruti, there are seven Manus who contributed to Manusruti. The very Sanskrit uh, that they follow, you will find seven structures, from Prakit to modern Sanskrit. You will have slokas uh, from everywhere. So, you have seven Manusrutis. Which Manus Manu is the Manu? Which year it started? No one knows. Right? And see Vyaspati Sutra. There are 11, I am told that there are 11 persons, 11 disciples of Vyaspati contributed to this Vyaspati Sutra. Right? Who they are? Where is their history? Locating that, maybe anthropologists may also now be required to go around the centers, around the country to dig out and then find out all those to actually salvage. So, even if you have some literatures, good literatures, where history can be retrieved, history is definitely, has to be retrieved, but very difficult to retrieve. And uh, maybe, one you said, you always uh, thought about tomorrow, after independence, tomorrow is what? So, today, yesterday was lost. And our yesterday was the history of downtrodden. But institutions were from, you know, it started from, uh, even in the court, in the high court of Calcutta, it started with a, um, a Nandu Kumar's uh, execution, right? For a charge, for a charge which was not really proved. So, it is British who has given us the common law in the form of statutory law, but perhaps killed the whole systems of energy of legal uh, processes. Maybe there are many reasons for that. There will be many reasons for that. Finding reasons also 
is a matter of study. So let us hear from some historians. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who's taught history at the law school for the last 25 no, years, no. Yeah, give uh, it, yeah. if you ask the question, why is it we, uh, the condition that we come to, to say that legal history or history should not be taught in law school as a compulsory course, uh, I think it's a question of who manages uh, what is to be taught to the law schools. So since this is the Bar Council of India, it is extremely problematic. Uh, it can, the Bar Council consists of lawyers, practicing lawyers. Uh, and most of them come from a generation where legal education was uh, done very differently, not as seriously as it has begun with the law school type institutions. And I don't think they quite appreciate uh, the understanding of what is history. So when Professor Mitra has been talking about the lack of history uh, writing or a consciousness of what is history in pre-colonial uh, days, or for that matter pre-Mughal days, uh, I think it comes from, so respectfully uh, differing from your position, is an understanding of what is history was so different in the pre-Mughal days. And we have one of the excellent works that has been always cited by Britishers themselves and by Indian historians is the work of a Kashmiri historian called Kalhana, uh, who wrote the Raja Tarangini, which is seen as the one more, uh, the earliest modern approach to the study of history in the Indian subcontinent. Now, not having that kind of a context of understanding what is history, the discipline of history, unfortunately, has resulted in this situation where today the Bar Council has decided if we are reducing the number of compulsory courses, let's drop history from it. In my own law school, uh, when we had a vice chancellor who came from the World Bank, um, he reduced the three history courses that we had to two history courses. Uh, and on the other hand is with the discipline of history. The discipline of history in India hasn't been as keenly interested in legal history. I mean, given the 5,000-year-old history of the subcontinent and the um, variety of cultures and communities and issues that are there, our uh, historians in India haven't really gotten into legal history. So the little that has been written on the legal history of India has largely come from uh, Western scholars, whether located in England or in America mostly, with, of course, a few from your continent, Europe as well. Uh, it is only the younger generation of uh, law graduates who have begun to explore, uh, you know, legal history with, of course, when I saw even Aparna Chandra's interest in it or some of the scholars from Delhi University, I realized that there is, in recent times, a little bit of interest. And I think it is that all these two together have resulted in the situation where uh, you have the Bar Council deciding that uh, history does not have to be taught in the law schools, which is really unfortunate given that, as Professor Mitra has pointed out, you cannot teach law without understanding the historical context of its development. And so that is my two bit of <laughs> intervention as to why this has happened uh, in India today. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mitra, you so I uh, didn't have much of a comment, but more of, uh, I think, a couple of questions. But to start with a suspicion, and of course the historians here may correct me, is the kind of timeline which is often drawn disciplinar uh, disciplinarily uh, when it comes to the notion of history itself. Somehow history stops at independence. And there is, uh, and of course things are changing, and th this is coming from a person who's not trained as a historian, uh, that what happens after the founding of the republic also counts as history. But more the question I had, and I, I guess uh, uh, I've been sort of distant participant of these conversations, but good to have Germans around. My question was more about uh, the methodological um, contrasts between legal practice and the methodology of historians. Uh, what can lawyers learn from the methodology of history coming from the history department. And the reason I ask this is, at one level, lawyering and legal practice is based on building certain mythologies. So mythologies of unity, mythologies of consistency across time and space, and historical method is at one level trying to problematize precisely those notions. Uh, the reason I ask this, is my, my question is, what can lawyers and legal practice learn from the genuine methodologies of historians? Because perhaps the answer to this also 
uh, would point us to why lawyers necessarily must learn the historical method. It's not just about facts, it's about the historical method. Uh, and it's coming from formalistic legal traditions, say in Germany, in, in a very, uh, is a clear case, but all legal traditions are based on those forms of formalisms and mythologies. So uh, that would be an open question, what do historians think lawyers can learn? and whether they would introduce more self-reflectivity in when it comes to legal practice itself. Can we bust the mythological bubble of legal formality? Is that a possibility when it comes to historical method? would be that uh, there is a lack of uh, multidisciplinarity in higher education. In school we read everything, uh, but as we go up we specialize and we specialize so narrowly that it precludes a large number of possibilities of cross fertilization of disciplines. Now the problem with the uh, history uh, is that it embraces all aspects of the human past and therefore if you are an economic historian you think you are sufficiently equipped to study economic history uh, and you know if you are um, uh, let's say a historian of culture then you have sufficient uh, knowledge of culture and you can specialize in cultural history so on and so forth now that can happen only up to a point on the other hand, what, what is happening is that each discipline is becoming a province of distinct specialism. And there is so much of technical finesse and vocabulary of that discipline. That allows the to to part. It's very difficult for a historian to uh, talk with a lawyer on certain, if the conversation is technical in nature. So one way in which history allows uh, 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 quote unquote technical uh, subjects to widen the possibility of understanding uh, the antecedent of an institution or a practice is to tell the story of how institutions evolved over a large, uh, uh, over, over a large part of time and over, over across regions. Uh, for that, the methodology is quite similar to, and we were talking about that, uh, to what the lawyers do. One thing which is absolutely essential between the two is evidence. No historian can proceed without evidence. And history is one of those disciplines which embraces all kinds of evidence, much like what happens in the court. The court also accepts evidence if it's if it's if the quality of the evidence is not suspect it admits historians read everything from epigraph to text to coins to paintings to film clips everything so that's a common uh, point between historians and 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 and, and the legal and those who are doing uh, law and legal profession the second is that you interpret just as you do in uh, uh, the legal profession if you are a judge you have to interpret and the limit of that interpretation is also negotiated over a long period of time. It can become very wide in a liberal society and it can narrow down to... Uh, so I think one reason is lack of multidisciplinarity, which is a circular reason. You don't have historians who know sufficiently about law and therefore they don't teach legal history, they don't produce histor historians who can do legal history and therefore that cycle continues. And the second is a huge possibility of interaction between law as a profession which embraces practically everything about modern human uh, life and history which embraces everything about modern human life in the past. For long time of independence, we were solely relying upon the decisions of the Privy Council. Had history not been preserved, the position would have been different. So, today's civilization 
is only on account of the past. How, because we are able to mold or rectify mistakes which were committed by them and going further. Therefore, history is essential in every area. Therefore, the subject of history must be taught even at all levels, intermediate, before that, graduation level, because history alone can give us the further facilities like without history, then the civilization may be standstill. Thank you. Do we have time? I mean, okay, all right. Uh, well, one or two um, sort of uh, random comments on uh, understanding history uh, in a positivist kind of way, uh, which is the 19th century European hegemonic understanding of history and history as itihas, which is what would be the Indian tradition of understanding our past. Uh, after all, history is a kind of mixture of, say, time, sequence, causality, narrative, uh, Ver uh, verifiability and so on and so forth, uh, which in the positivist frame would be located in an archive, right? which is largely created by the state or by state-oriented subjects, even law. Even law is a state-oriented subject because state appropriates law. Because if state doesn't appropriate laws, the state cannot function. So it becomes uh, therefore linear and it can only move from progress A to B and cannot move from B to A and therefore, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, a, a to B and A, it cannot reverse itself, it cannot reverse the gaze because then it will lose its linearity and therefore depositivize itself which is not permissible in, in a kind of modernist way of what you, how you understand history. But if you look at the Itihas tradition then you find that there is a lot which is historical but not in a positivist way as we understand history because after all history of institutions can be written through the Dharma Shastras, the Dharma Shutras are there, the Puranas are there and of course the entire religious didactic tradition which is at the core of the religious texts like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So the idea of history as a kind of positivist way in which the statutory element comes in in a big way because you are looking to trace history of institutions because then they can be objective. Hist institutions are supposed to object, you know, remove themselves from all kinds of biases and therefore pronounce as from, a, from above about what is right and what is wrong. Whereas, uh, impli in, you know, implicated narratives are more subjective and therefore they tend to lose that uh, kind of historical objectivity but they are definitely histories. And histories of institutions, for instance, uh, the kind of implication in the Arthashastra on the history of institutions, so the taxation, for instance, laws governing taxation and so on and so forth, where some things which even uh, later Mughal jurists, uh, Mughal, uh, Mughal uh, uh, you know, writers recognize the importance of what the kind of um, uh, laws governing taxation and an absolute and a statecraft meant in the past. So, that, I think that is where I, are the two notions of history uh, to not uh, converge. But uh, certainly the, uh, the notion of history as sort of
that doesn't happen with us, that this law is there. Law is in every one of us. Right. Of course. Like, but you know, you're saying that you're not a historian, so I'm asking after all. Uh, do, we, do, we, do we have time? I, mean, you know, I, I was actually wondering that as to why nobody has responded to his query. And I was actually wondering as to what kind of a conversation uh, can take place between a legal uh, specialist and a historian. Uh, he believes and he suggests that one of the ways and one of the means through which this engagement could come together would be, would be in us for historians to assess uh, legal specialists in dismantling mythologies. Uh, I'm not really sure about that because historians create their own mythologies, so uh, replacement of one myth mythology with another would take us nowhere. But I think with the difference, perhaps, uh, in, in, a, in a, you know, post-positivist frame of reference uh, would probably lie in the, in the ability of the historian to bring in diversity of experiences, uh, to, to bring in multivocality. And I think uh, the insistence of law in reducing that, that diversity into a homogeneous frame of reference. And I think this is where the real engagement could be a fruitful one. I guess I could follow that up. So one of the, uh, I want to follow on the, uh, the point raised that history ends with the coming of the nation state. And I think it has certain implication to think about contemporary ways in which we imagine both law and history as something that, that has this natural progression that must be studied when it's over. Uh, so historians' obsession with death literally as the beginning of history so what would it mean to think of the contemporary? And that's where law and history come together. I think one of the ways they can come together is to look at beyond state, the life of law and history as we are experiencing in the realm of the, broadly speaking, social. Uh, that would, one of the ways that could be addressed, uh, as was done at the previous institution where I worked on history of emotion. So what, what would it mean to think about both law and history as being mediated by the politics of emotion. Now this is something that we are seeing both in terms of, and I think mythology might be a good way. So in what ways mythologies, both about history and laws, are being created around a politics of sentiment. And we have Im increasingly a lot of example of this happening in India. Um, so whether it's of the politics about national anthem or discourse about law being mediated through a politics of hurt sentiment, this is something that's being also demanded of history. Histories should not hurt people. That's in some way, I think it is another way of thinking about what unites law and history is the way in which they actually have a great social life. And what, what, what are the implications of that? And I think that's, that's one sphere that I think, and I think the site of that actually is the contemporary life and not the end of history as it were with the coming of nations. So I think actually it might be very productive to think of the contemporary precisely as a moment to reflect on mythology making. Even if we do our regular courses on criminal law or constitutional law or even for that matter company or financial law, uh, the understanding of transplantation tends to be very narrow. Uh, for instance, it's either a Supreme Court judgment which is citing a foreign case uh, or a statute as, as Professor Mitra, Mitra was mentioning where you simply replicate a Western jurisdiction. Uh, but we don't do enough to think about legal transplants and their long-term impact. Uh, so as William Evold says that the first focal point of the transplant is the process through which it takes place. Uh, but then subsequently you have to evaluate whether the transplant was successful or not. Uh, so I think uh, in the way in which we have designed our curriculum in the law schools, uh, we have not done enough to address that, uh, that uh, inquiry with depth as to what happens several decades later, that despite the cultural or socioeconomic difference between the parent jurisdiction and the new jurisdiction, uh, what other forces have led to the success of that transplant or that failure. So I think that's a research inquiry that we have to integrate 
uh, not just in the way in which we teach our required history courses, whatever the bar council might have in their mind, but also for most of our doctoral subjects. So that's certainly a direction on which we need to build up in the, in the, in the future. history of GST in ancient India and um, if you look at Kautila's um, Arthashastra, it talks about uh, goods but not services, whereas if you look at um, Manusruti, it talks about both goods and services uh, as well as the limit of tax. Uh, if you go to um, Shanti Parva, Mahabharata, uh, it gives you a description of how much tax the king can take. The question here is that now if you have a GST at the central piece of legislation and a central collection in a, f in a process where there is a kind of constitutional system of, um, of federalism, are you not weakening the federalism? Are you not weakening the states? Now, it was at that time perhaps possible because there was one king. Can I take that historical processes now also? Now, those are the value questions because those are the comparative questions. So, actually positivism is perhaps not the positive outlook is perhaps not the only solution. Yeah. Yeah, you know that there is a much more than <coughs> at one Yes. Yeah. Seeing the thing, I was quite happy about one topic was on dispute resolution amongst Dravidian communities. There I just want to add something. Some of history stops mostly with the Bindias. It is never below. Last week I was in Bangalore in a university for some work. There was an organization which is practicing culture, history. They had some hundred posters. A lot of school children were coming to see the posters. Of course, their version of history. I couldn't find one South Indian king. I couldn't find uh, elections which were held in Chola time. I couldn't find many things what has happened in the South. In, in, in fact, as I said, that it's a dominant narrative as Professor Mitra, I thought he will also refer something which he read himself, but unfortunately it is never part of the discourse for, for a passing mention. So there is a huge amount of, you know, what you call as leave alone from positivism and other debate. The debate also has to include that, uh, do you have somewhere a dominant? I said that I know very well in my school days, I can by heart and tell you when was Panipat War 1, Panipat War 2, but I don't know when the big temple was built or what are the background of that, etc. was never even part of the school curriculum which I was reading in Chennai. So then you can understand uh, how much I have to narrate to other friends outside within the you know, same space. Thank you. It's like this that uh, many years ago, uh, my friend Nandita Haskar asked some uh, school going uh, student, what do you study in your history in Nagaland? And he said, I am studying about one guy called Akbar. <laughs> No, but sir, my question is different. Should in a law school we look at disciplines only from the perspective of making good lawyers or will law universities now create knowledge that we study legal history for no practical purposes except creating legal history as a discipline, as a knowledge. So will law school, uh, you know, be just professional institutions or we really have a genuine claim to be called a university which brings the universe of knowledge and is not confined to just the discipline of law and do legal history research for no other purpose except research, the creating knowledge. I think that should be the purpose. And the, at Nalsar, I would like that we get people and start doing this kind of thing to create knowledge. We need to create that kind of knowledge. Alone law universities 
and this was precisely the point that knowledge creation becomes a casualty. You might be imparting education of a very high order and uh, the context was the Dr. Ambedkar Law University Act of Tamil Nadu, which was, uh, you know, reserved for the assent of the president. And uh, there was a provision there that no other university in Tamil Nadu will, will, will conduct, uh, you see, courses in law. It was partly mitigated on account of the, I mean, you know, let us say the impediments which we created in the Ministry of Human Resource Development, but that is precisely the point that in a law school, I mean, I am not, with due respect, I mean, I am not very sure whether a good historian would like to teach for the rest of his or her life, uh, or an economist or a sociologist, I mean, you know, various disciplines, because, I mean, you know, the, let's say, the motivation to remain would be that much lower. Now, possibly creation of knowledge and quality research, even in law, would be relatively easier in a multi-faculty university. And uh, uh, whether multi-faculty universities have met this challenge or not is a separate issue altogether. You would know that better. I mean, but uh, this would be a problem. I can very well see it. And the last thing, as a former student of law, I can say that I think it is as well that legal and constitutional history have sort of ceased to be, uh, I mean, you know, compulsory discipline. Because I can speak for myself, I can speak for some of my friends who were in other universities like Delhi, etc. It, it was a torture to sit, you know, in classes where legal and constitutional history was taught because the person who will be teaching will be also reading MP Jain and that's it. I mean, you know, uh, so the, we do, this is the other aspect and here probably because <coughs> historians, as the point was made, have are not familiar with law. Academic lawyers sort of are innocent of history, so with the result that uh, I think legal history is not research, new knowledge is not created, and so the teacher sort of, you know, he might be teaching contract, that might be an additional burden on him, and he sort of also reads NP I mean, maybe some other, what you call, works would have come. So this would be the other problem. I think, so limited point, if I may sum up what I tried to say, is that I think a call also needs to be taken whether I mean, let's say the, for creation of knowledge in the field of law, whether a, you sort of, you see, standalone law universities will serve the purpose or not. law university, law becomes an institution, it is a positive outlook of the history. Now, in India, positive outlook of the history um, is also limited, source is limited, very limited. Source is one here, one there, one here, that's it. One partner, at one time it was extremely good in uh, historical analysis from the, from the positivist point of view. Uh, now, when you say legal history, you actually said um, you have a center for legal history, center for history, history for history. Now, actually, I, uh, I, I stopped that practice that's writing book, Economics for Law Students, is actually preposterous. Economics for economics. Let the law people read economics. History for history. Let the law people read history. Now. When you say law school, that is different. But when you say law university, you have to be multidisciplinary, universe of knowledge. It is a knowledge creation, universe of knowledge creation, and that is the emphasis. Elizabeth has not run up. <laughs> no, but, but sir, the other thing is why in our history departments, where there is no pressure, say we have a pressure of producing highly competent and then we added a word socially relevant lawyers for now, sir. How socially relevant our graduates are, we really don't know. But what about the history department where they are purely creating knowledge, why the discipline of legal history has not picked up there for, for the purposes of research? But that, that is a question which historians need to answer. There was this 
your query and you know the query of the entire house regarding the relevance of history you know uh, legal history as such reminds me of you know when the greeks came to india you know what was their observation they said that these indians are you know the, the entire population is barbarian on then then they fixed the criteria why they are barbarians they were saying that they don't have a script and the second criterion was that they don't have a law they don't have a law they uh, they don't have constitution they say because they had their constitution right you know uh, from the the uh, self fourth seven seven century bc draco had already passed the law then that was uh, uh, you know subsequently you know <laughs> revived say amended by solon and then there were whole host of you know lawyers there the who made their constitution ultimately it came to be known as constitution of athens so they were comparing with their you know practices and i find the situation very dismal in our country we have not you know really taken very seriously those observations otherwise we could have created legal history of you know, development of legal sciences here <laughs> yeah or um, in the you know in the matter of so for texts are concerned we have very scattered texts this yeah. is what is the history of This is very thin ice. I mean, I, you should break for lunch because this is very thin. <laughs> 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 there is a uh, there is a possibility. As Rajiv said, there is a huge amount of possibilities there. No? We we can collaborate between university and law colleges. Yeah. With that, I agree. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we will break for lunch and come back uh, at two o'clock. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>